For many, Vladimir Putin is a strong, decisive leader, an example to be emulated. Sometimes he seems nearly untouchable, yet strong leaders leave behind big shoes to fill. Currently, no one in Russia is qualified to replace Putin. In fact, the president himself may no longer be up to the challenge. Russian politics is often compared to a dogfight under a carpet. An outsider only hears the growling and when only one dog comes from beneath, it's obvious who won. At the moment, that's exactly what's happening in Russia. There is no mention of this in the mainstream media, but for the past few years, the elites have been in a rigorous power play. With the low energy prices and western sanctions, resources are shrinking. The oligarchs and regional officials are fighting for scraps of power. Putin may be a brilliant politician, but the Russia he has created is the new sick man of Europe. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. The situation was not always this bad. Back in the 2000s, the Kremlin envisioned an economic development plan called Strategy 2010 and Strategy 2020. The idea was to use energy revenues and European investment to develop the non-energy sectors of the country. However, following the financial crisis of 2009, both programs were abandoned. Instead, Moscow used its energy wealth for more immediate concerns. The following years, most notably after 2011, the government centralized more executive power to the presidency. The political and financial elites became more dependent on the president. Back then this wasn't much of an issue because of the enormous prosperity, there was enough wealth to go around. However, Putin's public approval was at an all-time low. Then in 2014, the Ukrainian crisis unfolded and everything changed. The events that followed led to the revival of Western Russian confrontation, a sort of a second Cold War. Despite warnings by the Minister of Foreign Affairs Sergei Lavrov, Putin ordered the military intervention in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. As a result, his public approval skyrocketed. Putin used his newfound legitimacy to centralize power by weakening the judicial branches and local administrations. At the same time, the role of the presidential staff and security council increased. Essentially, since the Ukrainian crisis, the Kremlin reshaped and centralized power more so than in the past. Washington and Brussels responded with unilateral sanctions against Moscow for its intervention in the Ukrainian crisis. Yet, despite this, the following year, Putin launched military operations in Syria and stoked up anti-Turkish hysteria in the mainstream media following the shootdown of the Russian fighter jet. To be fair, there are genuine geopolitical interests involved in Ukraine, Syria and Turkey. However, the method of violence which Putin chose to respond with, promotes a need for more confrontation. Thus, instead of elective legitimacy, Putin's public ratings shifted to the victories procured in abroad conflicts. Meaning, as long as the president can manage to secure military-based achievements, he will have the backing of the people. However, should he fail, he will lose the public support. A legitimacy that stems from military operations or disputes leaves no room for withdrawal. Hence, Putin is trapped by his own rhetoric. For example, Moscow cannot escalate the conflict in eastern Ukraine due to fears of tougher sanctions and it cannot retreat because of Putin's legitimacy. The longer this form of legitimacy continues, the less likely the government is able to return to an institution-based system based on the values of a legal state. When the American-European sanctions were first carried out, there was no immediate outcome. However, as the sanctions slowly expanded to include the military and energy sectors, resources in Russia began to dwindle. And soon, a recession kicked in. Two years into the sanctions, the political landscape in Russia has changed. With the lack of money to go around, Putin's ability to ensure the loyalty of the political and financial elites is in doubt. There are just too few resources to pay off everyone. Nowadays, oligarchs, governors and FSB officers are fighting for what little is left. 
the political crisis has now reached such a level that instead of subtle long-term corruption, officials have resorted to outright theft. In the duration of the crisis, some players have been weakened or eliminated and others have strengthened. Due to the highly competitive landscape, some of the elite are so desperate that they are now taking unilateral steps and preemptive actions. All of this is happening despite the warnings of the president. One prime example is the Bashneft affair. In 2014, oligarch Vladimir Yevtushenko was detained and his crown jewel, Russia's sixth largest oil company, Bashneft, was seized by the government. Bashneft was later lined up for privatization and many oligarchs had been eyeing to acquire assets in Bashneft. This included Igor Sechin, the head of Rosneft, which is the largest oil company in Russia. Putin explicitly blocked Sechin from making any bids on Bashneft since he felt that Sechin was already powerful as it was. However, the oligarch disobeyed the president and sought to acquire Bashneft anyway. Sechin teamed up with another oligarch, Eduard Kudainatov. Then, in 2015, Putin sent a symbolic message to Sechin. The president forced the resignation of oligarch Vladimir Yakunin as head of the state-owned Russian railways. This was a shocking move for the oligarchy, it showed that no one was untouchable. Since then, Sechin has backed down. If this was any other country or leader, the elites would have revolted. The Bushnift affair shows that Putin is still in charge, but his policies are openly questioned and challenged by the elites. Basically, the oligarchy is displeased with the policies of Putin. They want to do business with the West, regardless of geopolitical interests. Even the FSB has shown signs of disobedience. Last month in July 2016, FSB operatives raided the offices of the investigative committee, which is a powerful branch of the prosecutor's office that deals with political crimes. Another FSB raid targeted Andrei Beylaninov, a close personal friend of Putin and head of Russia's Federal Customs Service. Both crackdowns were conducted last month without the consent from Putin. Perhaps an even better known scandal involving the FSB occurred in March 2015. The director of the FSB, Alexander Bortnikov, and the Chechen leader Ramzam Kadyrov publicly clashed. It was a sensitive moment because both men were part of the inner circle of the government. Putin could not afford to choose one and alienate the other. Instead, the president did something unusual, he disappeared. It was a confusing time, rumors and conspiracies were all over the news. We don't know for certainty what happened, but most analysts speculate that Putin withdrew to allow the situation between Bortnikov and Kadyrov to de-escalate. And it worked. Bortnikov and Kadyrov are still at each other's throats, but at least they're not doing it publicly. The internal clashes between the oligarchs and security figures are overshadowed by the Western-Russian confrontation that has come to dominate the mainstream media on both sides. As a result, it's hard to see what's happening underneath the surface, and it's not just the elites that are frustrated. Russia is experiencing a recession. On top of that, Western sanctions and the low energy prices have made an economic recovery very difficult. With hard times ahead, the Kremlin has drastically cut spending, leading to growing social tensions. The growing resentment is especially notable in the federal republics of the Caucasus. For example, in Chechnya, the situation is so tense that it could fall into chaos if it is left unaddressed. In this context, it's important to understand that for decades, the insurgencies in the North Caucasus region were subdued by pouring funds to ensure the loyalty of ethnic clans. With Moscow's reduced federal subsidies for the Chechen Federal Republic, those ethnic loyalties can no longer be guaranteed by the Chechen leader Kadyrov. Interestingly enough, in early 2016, Kadyrov negotiated with officials from Saudi Arabia in hopes to secure financial support. Rijat expressed a willingness to invest up to $10 billion in Chechnya, however Putin, suspicious of Saudi influence, wants to keep the investment to a minimum. Since then, Kadyrov has been struggling to acquire funds to buy the loyalty of ethnic clans. 
This dilemma is very much a double-edged sword. On one hand, Moscow cannot afford the federal subsidies for the North Caucasus region, yet on the other, it also cannot allow for renewed instability and violence in the region. Some believe that Putin's highly centralized administration can handle immediate matters. That much is true, however what the Kremlin cannot handle are long-term issues. For example, if something happened to Putin, if he falls ill or if he suddenly passes away, then an abrupt crisis would hit Russia. In such a scenario, returning to elective legitimacy is unlikely. The parliamentary system is too dysfunctional. In fact, there is no viable political opposition to Putin's United Russia party. Most opposition parties are seen as junior partners of United Russia as they provide a safe and controlled channel for anti-government sentiment. For this reason, many will dismiss the idea of instability in Russia on grounds that the opposition is weak and that Putin's approval rates are high. However, the lack of true opposition means that the state is unprepared for a sudden, unexpected event. In such a scenario, instead of seeking constructive political channels, crowds of protesters may find themselves picketing outside the walls of the Kremlin. From there on, the situation could easily spiral out of control. For decades, the Kremlin stimulated a state driven by corruption. Now, the internal conflicts involving the oligarchy, FSB officials and regional governors are tearing Russia apart. The government is too centralized, with nearly all power concentrated at the very top. The decision-making top is simply overstretched. The Kremlin has considered carrying out reforms last month alone for governors, for district officials, the head of the Federal Customs Service and the ambassador to Ukraine were all replaced. The reshufflement may also indicate a shape of things to come as Putin prepares for a major political purge. However, a closer look at the events shows a different tale. The most recent overhaul comes ahead of the parliamentary elections scheduled for September 2016. These elections will set the stage for the presidential elections of 2018 in which Putin will seek a new six-year term. The officials that were replaced were from regions and districts where the United Russia Party has polled particularly poor. The truth is that Putin is replacing incompetent figures in hopes to gear up the necessary support for the presidential elections in 2018. What's more is that the July overhaul was spearheaded by the FSB's Economic Security Services. This is a special department within the FSB that is tasked with fighting corruption. In practice, however, they are monitoring the oligarchy and taking down billionaires, which itself is a very lucrative form of business. Basically, the July replacements are not the kind of political reform that will lead to genuine change. There are, of course, qualified people who could implement real reforms, such as Hermann Greff and Alexei Kudrin. However, the Kremlin fears that reforms could get out of hand, much like the perestroika reforms of the 1980s by Gorbachev, and that a decentralized Russia will be a threat to the territorial integrity of the country. In essence, the Kremlin is stuck between a rock and a hard place. It may not look like it from the outside, but Putin is trapped by his own rhetoric. His legitimacy depends on the military victories he can score, yet such a policy is unsustainable in the long term. What's more is that since the status of the elites will increasingly become more vulnerable, their willingness to challenge Putin will grow. This is especially alarming when one considers the recession Russia is experiencing. The economy is uncompetitive and too dependent on energy revenues. If this keeps up, inflation and unemployment will continue to rise and the living standards will fall as social unrest will increase. However, to whom the public will turn is unknown since there is no real opposition left in the country. Even envisioning a Russia without Putin is meaningless. First, no one in Russia is qualified to succeed Putin. Second, in the absence of Putin, the very foundations of the government need to be rebuilt from scratch. 
This would result in a disoriented society where the elites fight for public support. Without Putin, the situation in Russia will worsen before it will improve as the country could become a federation of oligarchs. On the surface, Russia looks like a besieged fortress. The national media gives the idea that the country is being attacked from every direction in Ukraine, Syria, Turkey and more. There is some element of truth to that. However, Russia has never collapsed under the threat of an external factor. It has, however, often imploded due to rising internal tensions. Therefore, the internal dynamics as laid out in this report are worth considering. This report was made possible by contributors on Patreon, and if you wish to support Caspian Report to produce more original content like this, then please visit our Patreon page in the description. Once again, thank you for watching, take care, and sarong.